collectively the countries of North Africa have unemployment at 25%. So if you just look at the averages, in almost every major economy, a quarter of the population are people who cannot find a job. And so what we are going to do this afternoon is move beyond the statistics and ask, how do we remedy the situation? Because the time for talking is over. It is now time to find solutions. If there's anybody who really knows what young people are feeling on the ground, it's you. Can you tell us about the sentiment on the ground? Thank you very much, Loretta. Um, I think that the first thing to do is to acknowledge uh, what you started off with um, about South Africa and what we've seen on the streets. I think that there has to be a, 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 a very uh, distinct session for us to discuss the issues of our collaboration as Africans. The reality of what we saw in South Africa is too sordid for it to be a mere conversation, by the way. This is the issue. We cannot have um, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, and yet we have a situation where there's black on black violence in this country. So I do hope that we're going to go beyond the marginal conversations of it and get to the heart of the matter of what kind of integrated Africa we want to drive forward. So that's number one. Number two is uh, to, to the issue issue that uh, we, we've come to discuss about promising the future. What does the future look like as we see it going forward? The future is the fourth industrial revolution and that which will come immediately after it. So we're talking of an Africa and young people who are going to be thrown and in fact, already thrown into a future that's made up of the AIs of this world, artificial intelligence, the robotics, internet of things. They are in the world and ecosystem where it is about blockchain technologies and all the machine learning and the algorithms and things that are totally way off the kind of education that we are offering them. So we are talking about a pool of people. You said 12 million do enter the labor market every year. I need you to know that only 10% of the 12 million would find anything that is defined as decent jobs, according to ILO. Now, if only 10% would find those jobs, and we've got this 90% that are on the margins of society, that is the issue of governance for us. We must look at the, the failure of governance to actually in, in, have the right kinds of policies that lead to growth. The growth that is diversified, the growth that is inclusive. And at the heart of this is what kind of education system, what kind of skills are we emphasizing, what kind of economic opportunities. You know, the great issue for us is that we have seen that if a sector actually gets the right kinds of policies, telecommunication, it changes slightly the structure of the African economy. We have understood that. So what is it about our wacky politics on this continent that's making us have people who are comfortable enough to watch the growth of the number of people that are on the margins of economic possibilities? That's the conversation. And I think that at the heart of it is that politics trumps economy on our continent, and that's a dangerous thing. So I'd like you to just spell it out very briefly. <laughs> are you saying that our politicians are counterproductive? Our politicians need to be put in a room and told that they have produced a miserable situation that is not worthy of the young people that hold them responsible for their fate. It is not a good thing, and I believe that the conversation about our politics has to be a conversation around the quality of politics that we play on our continent. You know there are two economies in this country, and it was never going to be sustainable. That's what we're saying. There are two economies traveling on their respective tracks and somehow never meeting. And the real challenge is that 
political expediencies, keeping your politicians from taking the right kinds of measures that are necessary to make this economy as productive and competitive as it should be. The opportunities are incredible. There's so much to leverage on. What is it that we know grows economies and expands opportunities? We know that if you have the sound policies, you're good. We know that if you have strong institutions and regulatory systems, you're good. We know that if you invest effectively and efficiently in the public goods that represent basic services delivery to citizens and to business, you're good. We know these three things. We know that economies that are enviable today, which used to be lower in GDP per capita compared to South Africa, take a China. A China went from where it was less than a trillion dollar yeah. of GDP to 14 trillion dollars of GDP. For goodness sake, we know that just embracing the basic principles of the markets and allowing the markets to set the incentive for the business. And by the way, my dear, you should get it right now. The business elite and the political elite will be in trouble in this continent. If you want to say it's not a business to talk to the government, huh? That's a bit of a, uh -huh. <laughs> Jim, you, you got to modify, you know? Because what the continent is in need of is an, a sense of urgency. Yeah. This feeling that we have comfort and we have relative comfort and we can manage to navigate it, mm. it's not going to last for long. I'm staying with we you. all must use our voice. <laughs> we need good governance on this continent. We need good politics on this continent. Because frankly speaking, Loretta, I came to this place not to be in a normal World Economic Forum, but to sound a stridency mm. that what we are seeing in our respective countries is not going to be wished away. And we I want need to stay to with tackle. you. I want to stay with you because it's not just South Africa that's in trouble right now. Look at my country. Exactly. And in fact, there's a UN report, but it's, it's, it's a bit of an old report, but nonetheless still valid. It found that 40% of young people who had joined rebel movements, militant groups, or criminal gangs, 40% of those young recruits said they did it because they had no jobs. When you are idle, when you are unemployed, you get swayed. Yes. So how much more of a problem are we going to experience? We're going to experience much more of it until we fix it. Problems are not, problems are not, uh, what do you call it? They're not rocket science. The good thing for Africa is that we actually find examples of countries and continents that have been down our path. But what did it take to solve it? We now understand some critical factors that go together to create growth. In all our conversation, I want us to take one thing away. We're not going to find band-aids as solutions because they don't last. We need real structural change. Structural change of our economy, structural change of our political landscape. And so what it means is we have to be more deliberate and intentional about what we're seeing on our streets. And we're not being that. You know what we're being? We're having good, normal situation conversations. Yeah. And that's very unhealthy because that's like playing the ostrich. Yeah. The young people that are out there are very angry, yeah. extremely angry, and they do not in any way differentiate between you, Loretta, yeah. me, and the Bilonia Jimovia. The fact that you have any opportunity at all on the continent means that you are in trouble. So what we therefore must avert our minds to is how do we expand the opportunities? If you looked at all the sectors of comparative advantage for Africa, 
Why is it that we have failed to take the very tough measures of the kinds of policies right. that would jumpstart the those economy, sectors? Yeah. That's where the opportunities right. will come from. But what gets in the way? Bad politics. Right. Our politicians live for themselves. Let's call a spade a spade, not an agricultural implement. <laughs> we have a problem of politics on our continent. We have a problem of bad leadership on our continent. We should not in any way hide it any further. Right. We must solve this problem ourselves. I think I need to say you're a former Minister of Education, so policy-wise, what needs to change? What needs to change is um, we need to render the very anachronistic ministries of education redundant. Um, a lot of what's going on is showing us that once you give a child basic literacy, education is now totally differently defined for the 21st century. And we need to upgrade our mindset to that. So change entirely, overhaul the education ministries across the continent. Take away these people who are still tied to the old ideas of the British education system, which they believe they are guardian angels for. We must overhaul that. Number two is we need to actually look at each of the sectors from where our opportunities can come and look at what it is that would make those sectors productive and competitive and, and then invest our policies and our institutions and our investment into them. And then number three, we need to get this conversation around the social contract between the leaders, the political leadership of this continent and the citizens, because we are operating a broken social contract. And that's why, instead of there being a conversation, we have conflict right. and friction, and it's time to change that.